Welcome to the teaching ministry of The Anchor, Calvary Chapel, San Pedro. We invite you to join us as we journey through God's Word together, learning how to be anchored in Jesus and reflecting His grace. Here is Pastor Jerry Cesario with today's message. All right, here we are in Titus chapter 1. Let's stand. We're going to read verses 5 through uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. Verse 5, chapter 1. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation and insubordination, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Verse 1 of chapter 2. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Father, thank you for this word. Let us learn these lessons as they've been written for us so that we might be uh, proper Christians in a world that hates you, that we would understand what it means to be separate and holy yet loving in this common faith that we all share so that the world would be uh, intrigued and want to be a part of the peace, faith, hope, and love that we have. We pray for this morning's tithes and offerings, that you continue to take care of the needs of your church as you have for 10 years. We trust that you will always do, but we also want to give you glory and honor for that. And we pray and ask you for this building, if it be your will, that you would just give it to us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, have a seat. going to dig right in. We're going to get through this little section here. We'll kind of get midway through chapter two, if the Lord tarries, or I don't talk too much. Uh, We're in the book of Titus. We started last week. It's a short letter from the Apostle Paul to uh, the lead pastor there on the island of Crete. As we saw last week, the intention of this letter is to remind Titus and the church, because these letters have been passed down to us, uh, to remind Titus and the church that we are all in Christ together in this common faith, and we are to act like it. Now, there were some problems in the church that will become very evident as the letter rolls out. Uh, There's some problems that needed to be fixed, and that's the case for the church at any time in history. So this letter can help us all tune up as a church. Listen, the Lord wants maturity in his church. And these letters of the New Testament, no matter how large or small they are, some of these letters are long letters. Philemon, we did in one shot. It was a one Sunday shot. We went through the whole book of Philemon together. It was still some great lessons for us. But no matter what it is, we are learning as Christians to be exactly that, Christians, followers of Christ. We, we are learning how godly growth in us can affect others and can affect our own lives as we grow in Christ. And that's what God desires for his church, for you to be mature in the faith. Now, as I said last time, a good portion of this letter is a repeat 
from 1 Timothy. We know, you know, the apostles would write their letters to the churches and Paul would recycle some material because it would be good for all the churches. Well, Timothy, uh, Timothy and Titus are an example of that where uh, Tim, Titus gets kind of a Reader's Digest version of what he already gave to Timothy. And so that's why if you're reading this going, didn't we just go over this? Well, yeah, a couple months ago we did. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, be brief where needed and expand likewise where we need to. So verse five is where we jump in today. Paul says, for this reason I left you in Crete, so he's speaking to Titus, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of details about the church in Crete. But apparently it was pretty big. That's why Paul references that elders need to be appointed in every city. So Paul had left Titus in charge of that. And he reminds him here, remember Titus, I told you to do that. And however the kind of the pipeline was, and as Paul would receive word from his itinerant pastors that worked under him and traveled and carried his letters back and forth, he had, he had heard, well, it sounds like there's some issues going on there in the island of Crete. They're a little, you know, maybe separated from the mainland there, and, and some of the false teachers have worked their way over there, especially the Judaizers, as we'll see, those who, who were teaching that you needed to observe the law of Moses in addition to believing in the cross, and Paul wanted to deal with that. But he tells in Titus, listen, you need to appoint some good leaders in the cities there. Remember, the church was made up of mostly home churches, the, the senior pastor had purview or leadership over all of the churches, but the, the, the elders would be who would kind of run the Sunday day to day unless there were times when the church would get together more on a full, time, a full capacity. And Paul says, listen, Titus, you have been charged with teaching the word of God, but you need to make sure that your elders understand what it means to be an elder or a pastor or a leader within the church. That comes from you. You set the example for that as you were taught. Now you need to do that with your leaders and your elders. Now, as I said, it will become clear that much worldly thinking, the Gnostics influence and the Judaizers had infiltrated the church in some of these areas. And Paul says this needs to change. The first step is to make sure that leaders know what is expected of them should they take the role of leading the flocks of Jesus. Just a note here as we read through these verses when Paul references to put elders in the, uh, the, every city, we have many cities and many churches today in this country, or just just say in the South Bay. Imagine how powerful the church would be in all of our cities if the leaders and pastors of these churches followed these biblical commands. And sadly, many do not. You may have been in a church that they did not. And for some reason, you just realized there was something off there, something wrong there. I want you to know if you've been hurt or affected by poor leadership in previous churches, first of all, please know that Jesus understands that. And he's very sorry for that. I'll give you his personal apology to you today because that's not how the church is to run. You're here now, though. However, however God has done that, don't think of it as, well, I'll try this church out and I'll see what happens. I would ask you to pray. Pray for the leaders. Hold us accountable to the scriptural standards that we read about here because that's what the shepherds and leaders of the flock should be doing is leading the people in righteousness and teaching in the word of God. And I, again, Jesus is sorry if you've been hurt. I'm sorry if you've been hurt. I hope you find a home and a place here of great peace and comfort knowing that things are okay as the word of God is just being taught. And these issues are addressed. You don't see churches that have poor leadership dealing with you know, messages about leadership because they just want people to toe the line and not complain and just fill the tithing box. Well, that's not how we roll here at Calvary Chapel San Pedro. So, Paul says here, what are the qualifications then? As Titus, as you appoint leaders, what are they, what's expected of them? They need to know. Well, verse 6, if a man is blameless, 
That word blameless, again, I'll repeat from 1 Timothy. It has the same meaning here as it does in 1 Timothy. Blameless means of good reputation. Things don't stick. Accusations are going to be made. In fact, he told Timothy, if an accusation is made against a pastor or an elder, make sure there are two or three uh, credible witnesses and then deal with the issue. Otherwise, people are going to get, you know, you know, they're, you know, up in a snit and they're going to want to say things on their way out the door. Or they're going to want to try to subvert leadership or whatever, and they're going to make accusations. Uh, you make sure that leaders are blameless or of good reputation. Things just don't stick when they're thrown out there. That the, the, the majority of the church, the rest of the church, when they hear something like that, they, they can not just like, no. Well, I don't think that, no, they should just immediately be able to say, no, our pastor wouldn't do that. Our, our leaders wouldn't do that. You know, well, where's your proof of that? Because that sounds pretty outlandish. That, that should really be, that's the general idea of that word blameless. It's just something that people would immediately be able to go, no, no, that's not, that's not right. The husband of one wife, we dealt with that before too. Doesn't mean that you can't uh, be in leadership if you've been divorced. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't, uh, mean that you must be married. As some uh, misinterpret that, it simply means you're not to be, you know, one who is always looking at the ladies. You know, again, the, glo the gold, the glory, and the girls. You know, those are things that you don't have your hands on in, as, as leaders in the church. It means that they're faithful men. Faithful, they're not serial daters if they're, uh, if they're single. You know, the elder of the church shouldn't have dated half the women in the church. You know, we laugh about it, but that's the kind of thing that happens in churches. You know, or relationship issues are worldly. And then there's problems and there's issues. That's one of the things I joke about. I always tell, tell people when they come to me, like, we're excited, you know, we're, we're dating now. And it's like, great, you know. And I tell them, you're Christians, so behave yourselves. <laughs> you know, grow, mature. You know, Lord willing, this will grow and blossom into marriage. That's awesome. You're Christians. Behave yourselves. And then I always will say this. Maybe you've, you've heard me say this if you've been one of those people. And I always say, but if you break up, you're Christians. So behave yourselves. Don't walk around here, you know, and don't say, this is my church. You got to go. And, you know, whatever. <laughs> Things happen. Be... Be a Christian. Behave yourself either way. Okay. Having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Uh, those words mean they're not, your children aren't out rioting in the streets, rebellious, lawless. It's basically, Paul's saying elders need to have their homes in order. For a bishop must be blameless. Again, the same word. As a steward of God. This is important. As a steward of God, not self-willed, leaders in the church understand that the flock belongs to Jesus. They're not there uh, to uh, do whatever is on their mind or whatever they want to do. The church isn't a canvas for them to dictate or rule or make everybody, I mean, you see these weird videos of these, some of these pastors, you know, they, you know, make the people all lay down and eat grass or whatever, just, you know, weird stuff. The, the church belongs to Christ. You are a steward of it. You're not there for your own agenda because the flock belongs to Jesus. And then to that end, not quick-tempered, not always wanting to fight, not given to wine. Again, there's nothing wrong with drinking unless it's a problem for you. But leaders, more specifically, need to make sure that it's not a problem. My personal opinion, and I'll say that again, personal opinion, I don't think pastors should be drinking because it doesn't set a good example for the flock. I mean, and we're having our 10-year celebration. We're going to have some catered food, maybe some barbecue. I don't know. If we started pulling out the ice chest full of, you know, Modellos and stuff, you know, uh, you're probably going to wonder what's going on. I've been invited to other churches that have Bible beef and beer night. 
And it's like, you know, we're coming together for a, a, a Bible study, but we're going to talk, we're going to have a different cut of beef every week. One week's going to be the brisket, then the spare rib or the, the ribs, and, and we're going to have beer tastings. It's going to be awesome. And I guarantee you what's happening when people are coming out for that is the, the, the beer is, is, the, is the showcase, the beef is what follows, and then Bible study is, hey, I, I got to work tomorrow. I don't want to drink too much. And Bible study probably takes a complete backseat when it comes to a Bible beef and beer night at a, at a church. That is just so, it happens. Again, I've been invited to those things. We keep our, some things just do not belong in the house of the Lord. I'm sorry. And again, that's what Paul is trying to say. You know, uh, you have that personal thing. Many people, just culturally, a glass of wine at dinner is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But some things just don't belong in church. We're not going to say, hey, it's nothing wrong with it and bring it into the church. That is a recipe for disaster. Because what is the church made up of? A lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds. And some people, one drink leads to being back on the streets while their brothers and sisters laugh and chuckle and have Bible beef and beer night. That's why it's all about us being for each other and the growth of each other and the building up of the body of Christ. Not violent, that's that word again, not being a striker, not one to just because somebody rubs you the wrong way, the first solution is let's get outside and, and go finish this up. You know, come on Saturdays, Patrick has a mat in the back for the jujitsu class. We'll, we'll use the mat and we'll, we'll really go to town here. That's not the attitude that a leader should have. Not greedy for money, of course. That's, that's a given. They say follow the money. Well, for leaders, don't be following no, no money. Hospitable, a lover of what is good. That means uh, that the leader's speech, activities, and associations should reveal that they're separated from all that is shady or questionable or wrong. Just known that they love good stuff. Known that when somebody looks at you and, you know, I, I love when people say, oh, you're a pastor. I don't mind that, but I certainly don't want to ever be in a position where somebody says, you're a pastor? <laughs> See the difference? It's subtle, but there's a difference there. Don't ever place yourself in a position where people say, you're a Christian? <laughs> because of something you've done or said. People should, you really want people to say, oh, you're a Christian? Tell me more about Christ. Self-controlled, oh, that's a big one. Let's go right back to Galatians 5 on that one. What are the fruits of the Spirit? What's, the, what's one of the biggest fruits of the Spirit? Self-control. That means a leader is led by the Holy Spirit, not by their own whims or out-of-control emotions. And by the way, these apply to all of us in the body of Christ because, and I'll just throw the blanket out over everybody, you've all been called as priests and kings. You're all leaders, whether it be in your home, that's why we celebrate mamas today, whether it be in your home or your workplace or your school, we're all leading somebody by example. And that's the way it goes when you're a Christian. Verse 9 so in all those qualifications, the main thing is holding fast to the faithful word that he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is important for us to hold up for a moment and look at. A faithful leader must first know what he believes and hold fast to it. That's probably the message I'm working on because I'm teaching at the Bible study for the Longshoremen this week and I'm just going to do the, a version of the same message at the Bible study next week. It's out of Psalm 76 about being settled in your faith once and for all knowing what you believe and not being blown about by every wind of doctrine or whims of your emotion. Anybody who's opening the Bible to teach people had better know what they believe Yes, uh, each week I get to go through the scriptures and, and read and, and fill myself with more knowledge and commentary, but none of that is like, well, I need to know what I believe before I take this to the church on Sunday. 
A leader, a teacher of the word of God needs to know what they believe and be settled in what they believe before they ever open the book to teach others. And that's a big problem with many who desire to be teachers. That's why James says, hey, look, many desire, but you need to know there's a greater condemnation, a stricter condemnation, and that's exactly what that means. You're going to be held to a standard. And if you're all over the place with, with the Bible and you, you know, teach one thing on a Sunday and then you watch a YouTube video and somebody who's, you know, chicken little and the sky is falling and you change your entire direction of what you believe the next Sunday, that's not good. That's inconsistent and that's not how we are to be. You need to know what you believe. Be standing firm in the faith, holding fast the faithful word. Faithful leader knows. Once he or she has wrestled with the text, and I do say she because there is a place for the ladies to teach in the church, and that's, as the scriptures say, teaching the young women, teaching the, uh, the ladies of the church, teaching your children in the children's ministry. I was glad there was a good turnout yesterday for the children's ministry breakfast and training. Children's ministry is a, a valuable ministry. The women's ministry is valuable. So uh, once he or she has wrestled with the text, secured their faith, then and only then can they teach and instruct and guide others in the faith and in the scriptures. Again, rather than get caught up in fads or programs or winds of false doctrine that blow through the church at any given time, uh, the wind's been fairly still lately, which means there's probably a storm coming. And we'll see what happens when the graduations finish and we'll see how the world's viewpoints start going as it spills into no college and into the streets. Get ready, church. Always be ready for some wind to blow through the church that affects the church. That's why we need to be firm in what we believe because the real mark of godly leaders is that they stay the course and do not waver. And as Paul says, they also stand firm and exhort and convict those who come into the church with other doctrines. I think Paul had this as his main concern because he takes a moment to expound upon those that do come into the church with some pretty wonky stuff from time to time. Look at verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. That word insubordinate means unruly and disobedient. And we've dealt with that before in 1 Timothy. We've dealt with that in many of Paul's letters. There's always people that seem to find themselves coming through a church and it doesn't take long before you realize some people can just be unruly and disobedient. They're just not going to be taught anything. They know it all and they're not going to be corrected which is exactly the opposite of what Paul says here. You need to be able to stand firm on the faith and convict and exhort those who are off the charts. Spurious is the word. Aaron and I were talking, I used that word, and he, he wanted me to correct that. Spurious, a spur off of a tree. Any gardeners out here, what do you do when you get a spur? You know, sometimes you have to clip that, bind it up, get it, so that it doesn't continue to keep growing there. You don't want spurs off of the vine, which is Christ. You want us all to be fruitful, growing together. These people talk and talk passionately and powerfully, but the truth is their talk produces nothing of any spiritual truth or benefit for the body of Christ. In fact, it robs people of the truth and leads them into error. This was especially true, as Paul mentions, those of the circumcision, meaning the Jewish teachers who would profess to be Christians, yet insisted that Christians follow the law of Moses, all of its dietary commands and Sabbath and circumcision. That was the crowning achievement of being uh, you know, faithful to God was to be circumcised if you were a guy. That was deceptive and demonic. It's a denial of the all-sufficient work of Christ on the cross as the final sacrifice for sin. And Paul calls it what it is. He says in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not 
for the sake of dishonest gain. There's always a fee that people are trying to extract from the people of God. Fleecing the flock, as the old phrase goes. When Paul says their mouths must be stopped, you need to understand that the specificity, specificity I can't say that word, of the language there, as I'm trying to talk about language, it means to muzzle or shut up. Those are hard words. But spiritually speaking, doctrinally speaking, the authority of God's word, when someone com- comes with false doctrine that is demonic and, and potentially damaging to the church, they are to be muzzled. They're wolves. You don't want a wolf walking in that can bite everybody. Just like a dog that gets unruly and you have to muzzle that dog. But I like the other uh, nuance of the word, shut up. I'm not quite sure how to lovingly tell someone to shut up, but it can be done. If they, yeah, zip it. (laughs) This is what you're doing. This is what I want you to do. But really, that is being nice. We need to muzzle those who would bring false, dangerous, and demonic teaching into the church. That's interesting because he says they uh, who subvert whole households... That's still the method of many cults today. They go door to door, secretly trying to teach their demonic doctrines to people outside of a church setting in order to draw them in and draw them away from their churches and come to theirs. But they do that by going door to door. You know what I'm talking about. There's many groups that still do that. Paul is saying that if they're allowed to continue unchallenged, they will do great damage to the church. And the leaders that Titus is appointing to these cities need to be on top of that. And Christian, listen, there's nothing wrong with being blunt about false teaching and false teachers. Paul is even more blunt now. He's blunt in his letters, but he's even more blunt now. Look what he says in verse 12. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. So he's talking about the Judaizers again and all the stuff they're trying to bring in for law keeping. Here, Paul reminds Titus, and this is interesting. He reminds Titus of the kind of people he is dealing with there in Crete, people who already had a certain reputation among the ancient world. This is a pretty blunt and caustic description that Paul gives of the false teachers in particular, but of the Cretans in general. And what he does here is he quotes Epimenides, who was one of the poetic spokesmen who lived around 600 B.C., and he called the Cretans liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. It was kind of like a, 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 a thing about them. That was their, uh, you know, when you thought of Crete in the ancient world, you thought, oh yeah, if we're going into Crete, just be in and out. Because those people there, boy. You know, it seems that every people has national characteristics, but few could beat the Cretans in their depravity. In other words, they were Cretan strong. You know, they had the bumper stickers and the, the, the T-shirts. <laughs> they were Cretan strong in their lazy, gluttonous ways. And they didn't care what others thought about them. Paul uses that to say, that is not Christian. Listen, a couple of points here. You probably know where I'm going with this. This shows us why it's important for Titus to appoint leaders and elders in the church because without good leaders and good examples, chaos and error would dominate the churches. But Christian, listen, it cannot be stressed enough that Jesus has called us out of this world and he has done this in order to change us and make us wonderfully united in the common faith that we share that is found only in the church. Yes, there are many beautiful 
qualities in our ethnic, historical, family backgrounds, and that makes us perfectly suited to testify of Christ as we gather together from all of our backgrounds. But, and you know this is true, the scriptures say this, we are to purge out that negative, ungodly pride and qualities that are not Christ-like. As followers of Christ, as spirit-filled believers who are being changed from glory to glory and supposed to be growing in the faith and in the gifts of the Spirit, we simply cannot say or maintain an attitude of, well, you know, that's just how we are. Fill in the blank. My people, my ethnic background, my history, my city. That's not acceptable for us. That's not a badge of honor. According to scripture, it's actually dishonoring the Lord who bought and paid for us and saved us from sin and brought us out of the world to purge from us that kind of thinking. So I love my town. I love my church. But we are Christ strong here. We're not San Pedro strong. We need to understand that there is a calling greater than our ethnic, historical, family, clans, and backgrounds. We are part of one family now. We are part of the family of Christ. And we need to understand that. And Paul uses that idea of the Cretans and how they were known in ancient society, and it wasn't a good thing for Christians to have that same attitude. I love you guys. Just giving you God's word. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even in their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. These verses, especially verse 15, are a little tricky. Many have debated their meaning. It says, to the pure, all things are pure, and then it's followed by a very strong rebuke. Well, what's really going on here is that Paul is clearly addressing the false doctrines of the legalists and the Judaizers, those who specifically taught that you must abstain from certain foods or activities to be saved. He dealt with this deeply in Colossians, Galatians, 1 Timothy. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he warned uh, Timothy about those who were forbidding to marry commanding to abstain from foods which God has given to created to be received with thanksgiving for those who believe and know the truth. It's all the same idea. It's just a condensed version. He's returning to that idea. Those that would impose restrictions upon Christians. You know, that whole forbidding to marry. The, the Gnostics taught that sex was dirty. The best way to be holy was not even get married. What's well, totally wrong? No kids, right? We're adults, teenagers, and you need to hear this. Sex and the parameters of God's design for marriage is a blessing. can keep you from falling into sin. It's an awesome thing. Trying to abstain from those things, especially even being married, that's, a, that's disaster. Satan loves to ruin and destroy what God has called good. Forbidden foods. Observing restricted foods from the law will make you holy. That's totally wrong. All things are pure now. There's no restrictions. Acts chapter 10 makes that very clear among other passages in scripture. Colossians chapter two. Paul knew that if a Christian walked in the purity of the Lord, these things would be pure to him. Those that teach the law and other restrictions upon believers are false teachers and Paul calls them abominable. That means hell bound. They're teaching damnable heresies. They're disobedient and disqualified for every good work. So stay away from any teaching that tries to put you under the law. We're under grace. We're not under the law. Our purity is found in Christ and the finished work of Christ on the cross. Christ, grace is not a license to sin or indulge in sinful behavior. We are all called to come out of this world and live lives of holiness. That's the bottom line, and it's clear from the scriptures. Grace helps us do this, 
and brings us to our knees in thankfulness and gentle conviction by the Holy Spirit. Not condemnation as false teachers do. It's the worst thing that happens in churches that press legalism. You, you don't walk out of church feeling like you've honored the Lord and been blessed by the Lord. You walk out of church feeling how low and unworthy you are and maybe you shouldn't even come back or bother to even be a part of the church because you have so much sin and this teacher got up and told you how sinful and wretched you were. And that's not how church is supposed to be. That's not how the scriptures teach us. All things are pure. Walk in Christ. Walk in purity. Enjoy the pleasures of life. Don't put restrictions on you. As, as James said to the council in Jerusalem, why put on a yoke upon the Christians, the Gentiles, a yoke that our, even our forefathers couldn't bear? Because no one can keep the law. Well, after bringing that strong warning to avoid false doctrine, Paul returns to what lives should look like when we're in good doctrines. And that's what he says here. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And then in the next several verses, it's a repeat of First Timothy. I would encourage you to go back and read First Timothy 3. It just talks about the roles of men and women, husbands, wives, parents, uh, workers, bosses. It's all stuff you can go back and read. It's good stuff. We're out of time today, so I want to bring us to a point where we finish this up. Verse 7 is important. In all things, showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned so that one who is an opponent would be ashamed. Again, it's that whole uh, nothing that, not, having nothing evil to say of you. It's that whole idea the fact that people can make their accusations against us, but they'll be ashamed if our lives are not bearing out what they say. And they, they, they can't get anything on you because you're walking in integrity. And that's what these scriptures teach us. Overall, the lesson is, what we're getting from this letter, again, is our common faith. As Christians, simply put, our lives must conform to doctrine. And that word doctrine, again, it's not a dirty word. It just means teaching, instruction. It, it's, it's how we live based on what God's word teaches us. Our lives must look like what we believe, and our conduct must reveal that we really believe what we say we believe. The message is the same. For leaders, servants, men, women, young and old, husbands, wives, parents, children, workers, and bosses, the grace of God should produce a godliness in us that is evident and visible to the world, and not in a way of feel, making them feel condemned, but in a way of making them feel welcome to come and join us on this great journey towards heaven together. That will be the very apex of what we will read beginning next week in verse 11 and 12 when Paul talks about the greatest measure of our hope, the fact that Christ has come and appeared to all of us, teaching us how to live godly lives. Christian, I'll, I'll get ready to end with this word. Christian, believer in and follower of Christ we only have each other in the body of Christ and how we live and act with each other forms our common faith. Once again, the mark of maturity in a believer is seen in their sense of responsibility for others. Because the truth is, our lives are intertwined together for better or for worse. We're gonna be together for eternity. The relationships that we form here on earth should be lived in light of the fact that we're going to be together forever in eternity. And we should act like it. Conversely, our lives are also the lifeline of the gospel for those who are drowning in despair out there and overwhelmed by their sin. Our true godliness can demonstrate to them that the gospel has real power to save them from sin and change their lives 
And in that sense, we provide real hope that change is possible for them. Because our real, honest faith, love, and hope in Christ, through that, we show the world that their tomorrow does not have to look like their yesterday. And think about it. For many people, every day they wake up is a misery because they deceive themselves by thinking today is going to be better because yesterday was horrible. And then that day goes by and they repeat that cycle every day. You and I wake up every day refreshed and blessed by having the breath of God in us and a destiny and a sure foundation and a sure hope of where we're headed no matter how the day turns out. So let us all endeavor to have the right attitude and the right actions to back it up in love so we can all enjoy the benefits and blessings that Jesus has for his church. That's it for today. Listen, I love you guys. And walk with Christ. Be excited. And pray that God just begins to, to really draw people for life and godliness and happiness and peace and joy and faith and love that we have in this common faith together. Amen?